coming and sharing <laughs> your story with us. Well, uh, we'll very informal uh, start. Happy to be here, and uh, I want you all to know that I was not uh, an off officer in the Navy. I was a swabby. <laughs> be that be that as it may. Uh, I, was, I was good enough at what I did in the Navy that after the war was over, they held me as essential personnel for an extra year. Without, without, with that, I'm going to say I have a picture here of the K-class blimp, which I'm going to pass around and you can look at it closely. <coughs> but first, uh, on my uh, autobiography, so autobiography, so to speak. <clears throat> in case anybody doesn't know, I was born in Meadville, Pennsylvania, which is a small town in northwestern Pennsylvania, about 30 miles south of Erie. Now, their only claim to fame is the fact that the inventor of the talon fastener, or the zipper, lived there. So Meatville is about 18,000 people. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, which at that time was known as the rubber capital of the world. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Attended grade school, high school, and Ohio State University. Now, I, uh, it's noted in here, I was the biggest kid in my class when, when we graduated from the eighth grade. And I was not allowed to play football. So I wrestled, and I played, played in the, in the uh, high school band. I went to college, same thing. I was not allowed to play football. Matter of fact, I wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. My father's what? Yeah. Well, my my mother had a uh, brother that was killed playing football when she was young. I wanted to be a doctor. My father said, "I'm paying the tab for college, engineer." <laughs> well, out of out of the three of us, he got two engineers and an architect. <clears throat> So I, th I think he did a good job there. <laughs> uh, and we're going back again, I was uh, not allowed to play football in college either. So again, I wrestled, and I played in the ROTC band. After I got out of school, You couldn't get a job. This was in 1939. I was out of school. You couldn't get a job without experience, and you couldn't get experience without a job. <laughs> so my father pulled some strings and got me a job on the design board at Imperial Electric. And it took me about six months to discover that I was not cut out to be in a uh, a mechanical designer of equipment. But I never knew, as long as I lived in Akron, whether I was holding a job on my own or because of my father's influence. So when I got a chance, I went to Pittsburgh. <clears throat> good, uh, Goodrich transferred me uh, to Pittsburgh as a rubber technician. And again, I discovered this this was not me. I had heard about a company called Coppers in Pittsburgh, which everybody assured me was a very fine company to work for. I went down and applied, and it was accepted. Now, Coppers was in the construction. One of their, their divisions was construction. They built coke ovens, blast furnaces, continuous casters, basic oxygen furnaces, that sort of thing. Although they did have 
uh, other divisions. The fast coupling division was one of theirs. Uh, American hammer and piston rings, coppers owned. <coughs> but in any event, I spent several years in the purchasing department, and for some reason or other, the estimating department wanted me to transfer up there, and the purchasing agent wouldn't wouldn't agree. Well, when things got slack, coppers, as most construction companies did, laid off. When they picked up, they hired back. And I got laid off. I was gone 14 months. The chief estimator called me after that and said, Bob, are you still interested in coppers? I said, absolutely. Well, he said, why don't you come, come in and talk to me? He said, I got a spot for you in estimating. Well, I had been there two weeks before I ran into the purchasing agent. He said, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm working in the estimating department. Well, this, this suited me fine. I did the rest of my working life in, in estimating. Now, when, when we were talking to other people in estimating, the big jobs like blast furnaces and coke ovens, we were talking in millions of dollars. And we threw these around very casually. Oh, this ought to be, you know, seven million. But it didn't make us any less cautious with our own money. Again, there's, a, there's one little thing here. When I went to Pittsburgh, I very unconventionally proposed to my wife. I said, I'm moving to Pittsburgh. Are you coming with me? <laughs> well, that, that being done, let's, let's, uh, let's say that that's it. Now, as far as my service is concerned, when they passed the draft laws in 1940, I was working for Goodyear, building blimps for the Navy. Consequently, Goodyear held me out on deferment until 1943. Well, by the time uh, I was, the, the, the program was winding down in 43, and I knew I was going into service, the draft board called me up, of course, off to Cleveland we went to the, to the induction center. At the, the day I reported to the induction center, I had a letter from Commodore Knox of the Navy directing me on completion of boot camp to report to the Naval Air Station at New Jersey, at Lake Durst, New Jersey. Well, at, at that time, a lot of young guys were having their teeth pulled trying to stay out of service. So I... Well, we're in the induction center, all of us naked as jaybirds. And the doctor came down and he said, now look, he said, I'm going to do a fast inspection here. Now he said, if there's anything wrong with you that would not be readily apparent from a, a quick inspection, let me know as I step in front of you. Well, the guy to the front, uh, to the, my left, and the doctor stepped in front of him. He said, uh, uh, sir, I have hemorrhoids. The doctor said, turn around and bend over. You see. He stepped in front of me and he said, uh, anything wrong with you, son? I said, no, sir. <laughs> I, I, had, I had dentures. <laughs> we got out of, got uh, ready to leave the induction center. And there was an enlisted man on the, on the door, on the out, taking your papers. And he had, you know, these gold stripes clear to the elbow. I said, uh, there's an error on that sheet. We don't make er errors here. I said, nevertheless, there's an error on that sheet. 
He said, where's the error? I said, you see there where it says, all teeth present, no fillings? Said, yes. I said, that's an error. Would you like to see them closer? <laughs> Which did not endear me to him, believe me. <clears throat> but on completion of my boot training in Great Lakes, I was went to uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey, arrived there as a semen deuce. Now, any of you who are in the Navy uh, know the way that the way the Navy promoted enlisted personnel. Every so often, they had tests. You took a test, and if you passed it, and it was a spot for you, higher up, you went. Well, I reached Lakehurst as a seaman deuce. Fortunately, about two weeks after I got there, they had one of these uh, test air times. And Commander Ivanhoe, who was in charge of the Naval Airship Supply Center where I was working, uh, told me, he said, don't worry, Bob. He said, uh, I'll take care of you. Well, I went from seaman deuce to aviation storekeeper third class in one jump and never took a test. The next time they had uh, tests, again, Commander Ivano said, uh, you're going to go take tests? And I don't have time. He said, don't worry. When assignments came out, I was aviation storekeeper third. Or first, I'm sorry. I went third and then first. But the Naval Airship Supply Center at Lakehurst, New Jersey, was the central supply point for the entire lighter than air service, regardless of where. At the bottom of this sheet here, I, I, there's a listing of World War II fleet airship wings and squadrons. Now you notice Lakehurst is the second one down, but Lakehurst was the lighter than air center. Moffett Field in California was the second. Now major, major uh, places where they, uh, where they had hangars, the blimp hangars, were South Weymouth, Massachusetts, Lakers, New Jersey, Richmond, Florida, Homer, Louisiana, Moffett Field, California, and Tillamook, Oregon. These were major centers where a blimp could have major repairs. All the other places that are listed were, uh, they did not have blimp hangers, they had mooring masts. Some of them even had pole masts they moored the blimps to. They could do minor repairs there, but nothing, nothing major. And if they, any, anything they needed, they had to come to us at Naval Air Supply Center and say, look, we need parts. Every once in a while, I'd get a stack of 8 by 10 glossies about that high. And some guy at one of these out, outposts would say, this is what we did to it. Send us what we need to repair it. <laughs> <laughs> would you want to point out on the picture up there? Your, oh. The layout? Mike, will you? Will you uh, OK. Lakers, New Jersey had five hangers. The main hangar was number one, number two, number three, and clear across the field were number four and number five. Now, during World War II... Well, where were you? Where was uh, your... Uh, oh, Naval Airship Supply Center was... Uh, you, you see that white road that runs down from the top side of hangar number one? No. Oh, oh, this one. There. One of those, one of those three buildings there, and I don't know offhand which one it is. Those three dark spots on that white road. That was the Naval Air Airship Supply Center. Well, that's yeah, and these were those huge hangars. Yes, about, right? that's not one of the big ones. 
That's not. No. I mean, that's fits that's a middle sized one. Okay. <laughs> wow. uh, again, I'm going to get into uh, how the thing. How the things got to be called blimps. Now, after World War I, both the Army and the Navy were dabbling in lighter than air. And somehow or other, they, they, had, they came up with two classifications, a class A and a class B. Now, the, the Army says the Navy did it. The Navy says the Army did it, and I have no idea. But the Class A was like barrage balloons, hot air balloons, helium, helium filled balloons, and the Class B was powered right with an air. So the word blimp came from Class B, limp, L I M P, limp, which means no interior structure in that envelope. So this is the class of your picture. Uh, yes. Uh, I, do, I don't know how much you can see there, <coughs> but the, the envelope yes. is in three sections. There's an air section forward of that cabin, and there's an air section aft of the cabin, but the main part of it is gas. Now the way they the way these things operate, in order to go up, they release air from these two ballonet sections, let them collapse, the gas expands, and there's more lifting power, and the thing goes up. For it to come down, they blow those things full of air, compress the gas, less lifting power, and the thing comes down. So you didn't carry ballast like lead pellets and all that stuff? Uh, good you're used to on, on, their, on their sightseeing blimps. The Navy didn't know. Now everything that went into a blimp was weighed. <coughs> Two products of equal quality. One weighed a little more than the other. The lighter one went into the airship. Now the, the Navy ordered these K-blimps in batches of 20. And uh, the first four were pre-World War II. But number five to uh, 25, the first ones, uh, during construction, they decided to put two, adip two additional depth charges on them. Uh, which had not been considered when the envelope size was determined. So they had to increase the envelope size for those. Then they put a 50 caliber machine gun on there and they put radar equipment in it, which meant a second increase in envelope size. <coughs> Where would you carry the depth charges and the Two, two of them were, were carried inside the uh, blimp, and the, the other two were outboard. Now, there was only one blimp was ever shot down during World War II. Uh, something went wrong with the, with the depth charges. They didn't release when they were supposed to. And the uh, sub skipper unlivered his deck gun and shot it down. Uh, this, this was during the night. And they lost enough gas that the, the thing came down to the, to the ocean, but didn't submerge. The next morning, they sent rescue boats out there and they rescued the entire crew except one man who had drowned before they got there. Now this thing they say a crew of nine to ten. I was never able to determine exactly what the crew was, but they 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 had a, a flight duration of 38 hours, 
So I would assume that they had two pilots, two co-pilots, two flight engineers, a machine gunner, a radar operator, and a gopher, I, I assume. As they, they had a, a galley on there, they served hot meals to the crew. So what was your, okay, your role, you helped provide the uh, repair parts and everything. Did yeah. Did you get a chance to go up in one of them? Uh, on test flights only. Ne it? Never long enough to get air pay. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like? Was it very noisy to be up there? Uh, one of not as noisy as an airplane, but yes, noisy. Uh, Plus, in addition to going this way, they go that way. And if you're subject to seasickness, stay out of blimps. So Goodyear uh, pilots on the, the sightseeing blimps that Goodyear had, one of their favorite tricks was to get an airplane driver on as a passenger. And they'd wait until he got the thing nosed up pretty well with the engines going full bore. Then the flight engineer would throttle the engines back to idle and they'd watch that poor devil turn green. <laughs> Goodyear had five blimps of their own, two L types, and geez, these were much smaller. And they're the ones that you used to see floating around with the big Goodyear sign on them. Uh, they, uh, the head of the Goodyear pilot crew was Jack Bettner. I, I don't know whether he was actually a German or whether he was USA German and was trained. But he learned uh, lighter than air in Germany from the Zeppelin Corporation. And he was, he was their chief pilot. He got himself suspended once for two weeks because he took one of the blimps out over Lake Erie and went fishing from it. <laughs> but he was, he was uh, well, available almost any place at any time. He, he, he circulated from base to base. Now then, Question, please. Robert. What were the other classes? The little, the little one, the smallest one, which good, uh, good you had, was was their first one, the Mayflower. That was an L type. Now uh, this was used by the Navy only for primary training. The G type, which was half again bigger, uh, was used for advanced training and for coastal patrol. The K-type were the only ones that were used offshore. Now the Navy bragged for many years that they never lost a ship in convoy when it was a blimp accompanying the things. And again, they, they bragged that they never lost only the one blimp that was shot down. But late in the war, the subskippers got smart. Oh, early in the war, they, they could fly about two or three hundred feet. And if the submarine was at periscope depth, which they needed to be to, for a torpedoing, they could see that sub down there. And they could, they could drop depth charges on it. But late in the war, the subskippers got smart. Instead of submerging, they surfaced and unlimbered their deck gun. But at that time, the blimp pilots were told, you go out there and spot them, and then you stand off out of gun range, and you call the PBYs out to kill them. How do you inflate something like that? So okay. The, uh, 
There are air tank air intakes under the nacelle of each one of those radial engines that blow air into these ballonets. Them. And then there's something that they call a, uh, it's gone. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a, a 37 inch air valve that operates on very little pressure that they can pull a cord and release air very quickly. Now, the, the, there is no interior structure in these blimps, as I've said. Uh, those of you that have looked at the picture can see a little uh, indentation running down along the top of that blimp. Now that, that is what, uh, where the catenary curtain is attached to the envelope. It hangs down inside the, inside the uh, envelope there and then the car so was it here? Were yeah, that that okay. that ridge right there. Uh, the the cars are hung from this catenary curtain, and if if you get a big enough hole in the envelope, the the whole thing just on the ground. Again, on the picture, you can see one of the control cables from the from the car up to the. Uh, yeah, to the fins. These are all on the surface. On a surface, not inside. <laughs> now, again, on the on the very front of the thing, you see some ridges. These are what they call battens, and they serve a dual purpose. In the first place, they strengthen the nose of that blimp to keep it from, uh, you know, uh, jiggling when when they have it on the mooring mast. And the second purpose. They extend down the the nose further so that the nose won't dimple in when they hit top speed, which is 78 miles an hour. But no. is there a connection up here so you could hook up to it? Yes, yes. There's a... <laughs> well, you, you've seen these connections on the 18-wheelers. Uh, mm -hmm. A similar, similar type thing. You edge up to it and drop into it, and the thing snaps shut to hold it. I mean, the thing is so big and bulky. How do you ever maneuver it to even come up to it more? <laughs> well, it is big and it's bulky, but it's lighter than air. Okay. Now, of course, this this takes a ground crew. Uh, if if there's a wind or something. They have ground crews out on both sides on long ropes that guide this thing. So you carry but the ropes with you or something and then drop them? They, they, they hang down permanently. Oh. I always wondered ah, how that the machine gun is right up under the nose of that cabin. You see the light right there, just just under the skin. Uh -huh. oh, or up yeah, up there. Oh. That machine gun shoots forward. And I always wondered how they how they operated a 50 caliber machine gun out that direction with those ropes hanging down. <laughs> but every time you flew, you had ropes dangling down. Yes, oh yes, they were permanent. Now the, <laughs> for some reason or other, and at least at Lakehurst, uh, early morning was a good time for the things to come in. And we, we would be on our way down to the Naval Airship Supply Center in the morning. And these things come sneaking in over the horizon uh, to be refueled and cleaned up, whatever. And just at dusk again. And it's, it's, a, it's a real sight when you see three or four of these things slipping up over the horizon to be serviced. <coughs> if you look at the, the performance, cruise speed is 58, maximum speed is 78. Yeah. Cruise speed is 58, maximum speed is 78. That's a 30% variation. What prohibited them from 
going closer to maximum speed and increasing the range? Well, the weight weight uh, kept them from increasing their range because with envelopes that size, you could only carry so much fuel. Okay, so fuel was a limiting factor. Fuel, yeah. But as far as the speed was concerned, those battens on the nose were box wood. They, they, they were not solid. They were built up of four, four spars glued together. And if you got much beyond 78 miles an hour, they would, they would splinter. But as you increase speed above 58, miles per hour, you were using more fuel, too. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, now, wait. Seven, 78 miles an hour was the top speed. Yeah. But if you went above 58, you, you consume more fuel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And now, the Navy, the Navy never made a point of it, but before the war, they had a couple of blimps, and they, they, they flew the things off heavy, like an airplane. Goodyear, Goodyear flew them off light. The crew of the ground crew would release the ropes, they'd go up, and then they'd take off. But the Navy flew them off like an airplane. And before the war one time, uh, they were taking one of them off. It wasn't the K-type, it was one of the others. And the wind blew it into the corner of number one hangar, which was 200 feet off the ground. Put a 90-foot rip in that envelope. Well, you know what happened to the crew? Were they killed? Oh, yeah, well, absolutely. 200 foot straight down. <laughs> now, I, have, I have found since this was printed, that um, uh, Martin, Martin, uh, Lockheed Martin is experimenting with lighter than air again. They have rented the Zeppelin dock at Akron, and they're they're working on what they call high altitude uh, blimps. But these things are going to supposedly what information I can get. Uh, they're going to be aluminum sheet. They're not going to be uh, rubber. Dan, didn't you say that Lockheed Martin had purchased all the Goodyear copyright? Or, uh, didn't you say that Lockheed had purchased, purchased the patents? Oh, yes. The Lock Lockheed Martin purchased every, everything that Goodyear knew about blips and the rights to them. What were the tails made of those four? What was what? The tail, the, uh, on the end, to, to change the direction, go up and down. Yeah. What was that made of? Was that solid? Oh, no, no, no. That was a, that was a, a light a Durrell framework to the shape. Then it was covered with, uh, with the rubberized fabric. Same, same as the envelope. How did you get the rigidity in it to run the uh, elevators? There was enough pressure in the envelope to, to keep the things, you know, from, from wobbling back and forth. <laughs> Main barracks. Permanent among 
among these is the Naval Air Technical Training Unit, conveniently called NATU. Here, qualified enlisted personnel pursuing the highly technical course of aerographer's mate are taught the study and the properties of air and atmosphere. Serious work, and the students take it seriously. They know that in any naval operation, whether of surface ships, planes, or airships, success depends greatly upon the collection and dissemination of accurate weather observations. Flying the weather. That's the expression used in this phase of the aerological training. In this flying classroom, students observe for themselves the many kinds of weather that can be encountered on normal flights. This practical experience stresses the necessity for disseminating enlightening weather forecasts, with great emphasis placed on such hazards as low ceiling, poor visibility, turbulence, and all other atmospheric perils which beset a pilot. classroom is especially valuable to students who will be assigned to weather squadrons. Dangerous work, for in this line of duty, the aerographer's mate must stop typhoons and hurricanes. Size them up expertly and make in-flight observations to the Navy weather centrals, where accurate and timely weather forecasts are collated for ship and aircraft operations. The Parachute Rigger School, also under the command of NATO, has an equally critical place in the Navy's complex operations. Here, students are taught the exacting technique of parachute rigging and packing. A parachute, when needed, means the difference between life and death to an airman. And these students fully understand the responsibility that will be theirs when they are assigned to fleet squadrons. The parachute rigger, moreover, is required to be proficient in the operation and maintenance of oxygen breathing equipment used in naval aircraft. And the care and use of all types of flotation and survival gear. The curriculum includes instruction in tumbling, rolling, and wind drag procedure for collapsing a parachute. This toughening phase of his training prepares him for a test which all parachute riggers must take. The test of making a free fall jump with a parachute which he himself has packed. No one who has ever jumped will be careless about packing another man's shoe. Naval activities based on Lake Hurst is a fleet air detachment consisting of Airship Squadron 3 and Helicopter Squadron 2 under the command of the Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Fleet. Squadron 2 not only provides operational helicopter support for all ships in the Atlantic Fleet, but it is well represented in Korea where its detachments are evacuating the wounded, moving up combat troops. services of importance. In the Navy's mission of controlling the seas and in the overall tactical patterns for anti-submarine warfare, particularly in coastal waters, the role of Airship Squadron 3 is an extremely vital one. For in the event of a war with a major power, it is anticipated by our naval leaders that the enemy will employ powerful forces of the latest type submarines against us. The United States Navy is prepared to deal with this threat in many ways.
millions of dollars in U.S. military equipment and lend-lease supplies without the loss of a single vessel to enemy submarines. In performing this great task, the airship fleet made over 55,000 operational flights for a total of some 555,000 hours in the air, with only one airship lost from enemy action. Today, with the world once again facing the threat of a global war, our country, in order to enforce and maintain the peace, is building a strong military establishment. Although the accent in the air is placed on aircraft which can fly higher and faster, the U.S. Navy, guaranteeing our use of the seas and denying that use to our enemies, continues in its development of a weapon which flies lower and slower. All this development and training is conducted at Lakehurst. Under the administration of the Naval Airship Training and Experimental Command, aviation rated men in the non-pilot school are taught the principles of aerostatics and other related subjects which will give them a working knowledge of the fundamentals of airship structure, material, maintenance, and ground handling. In the pilot school, experienced heavier-than-air pilots study the fundamentals of lighter-than-air operation. Airship pilots were formerly recruited from surface ships and submarines because airships, like water ships, are displacement vessels and swim in an ocean of air. But the new policy of training already qualified airplane pilots has proved decidedly advantageous. It has reduced the length of the course from eight to four months and is producing pilots with dual qualifications. A fascinating phase of the lighter than air pilot course is the free balloon flight. This is good practice for the day a pilot may find himself in an airship with dead engines. <laughs> the exhilarating effect of flying in a balloon comes from the complete absence of sound. There is no sense of motion at all, for the balloon travels with and at the same speed as the wind. Altitude is controlled by valving gas to descend and releasing sand to rise. Even a handful thrown overboard makes a difference in the equilibrium of the balloon and causes it to rise a little. Most of the training, however, is spent in the fleet type K airship. Piloting a blimp is a job of teamwork. The co-pilot operates the rudders which provide lateral control to overcome the wind while the pilot operates the elevators and controls the trim valves which force the airship up and down. Here we have one of the essential differences between airplanes and airships. In an airplane, trim is accomplished by tabs on the control surfaces. But in a pressure airship, this is done by balloons within the envelope called ballonets. These ballonets contain air and are controlled by the trim valves. When the pilot wishes to ascend, he applies up elevator and releases air from the forward ballonet, thus allowing the lifting gas to shift forward. This makes the bow lighter and tilts it upward. To descend, he applies down elevator and pumps air into the forward ballonet while at the same time releasing air from the one aft. The K-type airship is 250 feet long and 70 feet wide. It can track submarines for a day and a night. Refuel from a carrier at sea, change crews, and fly on. <laughs> the larger M type, or Mike ship, as it is known, has remained aloft for as long as 170 hours without refueling. This is 35 hours longer than the Russian record of 135 hours. Even larger than the Mike is the Navy's newest hunter-killer, the NAM. 
Equipped with the latest submarine detection gear, the NAN is the largest non-rigid airship ever constructed. Keeping an airship operational, flying in the air safely, requires maintenance checks every 30, 60, 90, and 120 hours. But at the end of 24 months, it is sent to Lakehurst for a Class A overhaul. Here in the giant overhaul and repair shop, it receives a reconditioning that is as thorough as it is time-consuming. The huge envelope is completely deflated, and the car is stripped down until only the skeleton remains. Each group of skilled technicians performs hundreds of specialized inspections and repairs. Engine mechanics. Electronic specialists. Envelope maintenance. All see to it that every defect, no matter how minor, is corrected. About 225,000 man-hours later, the work of rehabilitation is completed, and the tremendous job of erecting and rigging the airship begins. Before the inflation, a heavy rope net weighted down with sandbags is placed over the envelope to control and hold it down until the car is attached. When all is in readiness, the gas hoses are connected and the non-inflammable helium is turned on. The use of flame-proof helium as a lifting gas instead of the cheaper and lighter but inflammable hydrogen has been a fixed military policy in the United States since 1922. Since that time, not only has the safety of airship operation increased immeasurably, but not a single U.S. airship suffered a fate similar to that of the hydrogen-filled Hindenburg, which burned in that's currently in a blimp, mm -hmm. when you bring it in to, for service and you deflate the whole thing, you just let it go or do you store it? No, you pump it away. Yeah. 
you pump it away and restore it. For you. Yeah. I mean, healing is quite rare uh, and very expensive. Uh, so you're not going to just let it go if you can, if you can uh, use it. Mike, all of, the, all of the major bases, the ones that I pointed out that had the hangars, had underground storage mm -hmm. for helium. And when they, when they were bringing the stuff from Texas to the bases, the stuff was a compressed. You you seen these uh, oxygen tanks that the welders use? Okay, you multiply that to the length of a freight car, and to that big in diameter, and you fill that with helium to transport it from Texas to the base. And it's pumped into underground storage. Now, all I know is that the compressors in Akron. Uh, there were about 12 inch cylinders on the compressors. And they had, they had bolts, you wouldn't believe the bolts around the head of that compressor. Uh, one, once while we were there, uh, the head blew off one of these compressors. Three miles across the airport it went. <laughs> one last one. So I suppose that means that the uh, uh, not hydrogen in there. And it's used for a whole variety of different uh, chemical, or well, processes. Welding. Well, welding, yes. Yeah. Uh, you aluminum welding, I think, and some of the more exotic steel. Yeah. Uh, you cannot heat it up in the presence of oxygen because it'll, the, the welding will not work well. So you, in those cases, you're blowing a curtain of helium around this particular weld as you're doing this. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's what they call a heliarc welding, Mike. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there, it's used quite extensively. And again, it's kind of rare. I think in some cases we, well, I could be wrong. I thought we sometimes what you can do is you can get it out of the ground as part of natural gas, you know, stuff. And then you separate it out. Uh, well, it could be wrong. Exactly. Oh, that's right. I think. It, it, it comes yeah. out of some area down in Texas. Yeah. Well, that's how the MRO I believe. Yeah. But, oh, yes. Well, it would be the duty cycle of the flight crew when they were at sea patrolling the ship. Well, uh, the question was what would be the typical duty cycle for a crew when you're out doing the sea patrols? Well, the, the uh, of course, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the flight engineer, they've, they've got their jobs full time. Uh, the off-duty pilot, co-pilot, and, and uh, flight engineer would be used for part-time spotting. Okay. Of course, the machine gunner, the uh, radar operator, and the rest of them, they're, they're full time spotting. Well, I imagine also, I mean, the, we say the you know, maximum cruising cycle, whatever, is about 38 hours. So it's a day and a half. You probably have different crews. You know, so the thing goes out, you do it, you do one of your, whatever, come back in. All you need to do is refuel it, throw some more food on board, and you're ready to go. So quite possibly, and I could be wrong, you know, that crew comes off for a day and a new one comes on. But, well, yeah, five. I, I was in blips about 10 years after Bob. And they had the manned ships. Oh, these are much bigger. Twice the size of the spaceship. <coughs> and 
during the time that I was flying day ships, a man ship stayed alive 24 days. Hmm. Wow. Without refueling or touching the plane. Yeah. And you, you were on the M's? No, I was on the, I, I flew K ships, but. Do you know what the M's? Well, the, the M's were new. Well, Late the, in the war. The M ship was bigger than the Mike. Oh, yeah, the M ship was twice as big as the K. Well, the, the man ship was bigger than that. At any rate, they had a crew of about 30, and they could, they could run ships, you know. And, oh, right. And they, they cooked meals and, uh, yeah. So did everyone hear that, from what Bob was saying? He, re he was involved... Uh, about 10 years later, and if you saw in the film, it mentioned that the K ship, you know, subsequently you had larger ones. And the largest, I think, was the N class, which they showed a picture of. I mean, really huge. And what Bob was saying, they could go out on a total mission of about 20 days. Uh, so yeah, you, you had a larger crew size, about 30. So. You'd, you'd have people who can spell you, you know, for four-hour mm -hmm. shift and rotate and things like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, quite fascinating. It's a whole area most mm -hmm. of us knew nothing about. The, the Navy was trying to compete with the Air Force. Uh, <laughs> AWACS, early warning. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the super trannies that were flying with the big radars. So they were putting those big radars on man ships. The Connies, the Connies could stay aloft for about eight hours. Mm -hmm. The man ships could stay aloft for 24 days. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, it began the early warning competition between the services. Yes. So, yes, Lou. Did anybody ask questions about how these responded in severe weather? <laughs> would you? Would, yeah. Would any of you want to be up in it in a thunderstorm? <laughs> well, <laughs> They were, they were pretty hard to manage you know, in turbulent weather. They, they, could, they, could be, they could be done, but the big, the big uh, problem was getting them in and out of the hangar. Hmm. As a limp is not as like a natural uh, weather thing. Mm -hmm. When they take off, they can only take off into the wind. That's why they don't have runways at Lakers. Mm -hmm. They just had a big, you know, a big yeah. main field. Yeah. And uh, getting them in and out of the hand, if the wind is blowing you crosswise, mm -hmm. you just can't. Yes. Put them in. Mm -hmm. Well, when you look at the size of it, you know, the amount of surface area, uh, you very much are at kind of the mercy of you know, any significant wind direction. Yes, sir. Was that a normal, uh, a normal patrol? What kind of altitude were the uh, were the cages flying at? Uh, what would be the typical altitude uh, you'd fly a K-ship uh, and, let's say, a submarine patrol? Uh, between three and 500 feet. Mm, 500 feet? That's pretty low. Well, this yeah. was, this was the, 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 yeah. the thing. Low and slow. <laughs> yeah. So again, much lower than a plane would go. Uh, on bands. Uh, I worked with this searching for submarines with sonar. It towed a fish from a cable in the ocean flying about 300 feet above the water with a you know, a 2,000 foot cable, and, and they could fly, the, they could lower the fish so that it would go mm -hmm. three to 500 feet under the water. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Wow. Oh, now this, this I didn't know. <laughs> and uh, that way, if the submarine tried to hide mm -hmm. by going deep, Mm -hmm. uh, we could lower the fish to where we could stay near the depth of the submarine. A hydrophone or? No, no. Since, you know, probably uh, active, active sonar. Active sonar.
sonar. So I wouldn't want to hit a sudden downdraft <laughs> if I was only at about 300 feet well, of that. Worse than I When the man's so big, it doesn't move fast. Uh, even if you hit with a blast of air, it will just respond slowly. slowly. So let, let's go ahead and end it, but please stick around and talk with both Bobs here uh, about you know, their experiences and, and any other questions you might have. And we, again, we have more refreshments uh, in the back, so uh, please uh, join us. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. It was it was a pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. It was fascinating.